In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Well, today, our uh, feast, uh, we celebrate um, St. Margaret of Scotland and uh, quite a remarkable uh, life story she has, which we will find out about. Um, she was called the uh, Pearl of Scotland and um, uh, it wasn't easy for her. Uh, she was born to a Hungarian princess, Agatha, and her father uh, was Edward the Exile. He was uh, uh, in line to be heir of the um, uh, throne of the Anglo-Saxon kings in, in England, uh, but due to the invasion, the um, Danish barbarian invasion, he had to flee for his life. So her father spent 30 years in exile, uh, married uh, his, his mother there in Hungary, and she was born there, uh, St. Margaret was, uh, and when she was 12 years old, uh, her father was called back to England to uh, inherit the, the throne. So, so this was, you know, rather exciting for her to go off on this, this adventure. But as soon as they arrived, like within days of arriving in England, her father uh, died. Whether from natural causes or something suspicious is unknown, uh, but that was a great blow to the family. So here they were in a completely different country, and their husband had died, and there were other claimants to the throne who weren't too friendly to the family because um, St. Margaret did have a brother uh, whose name also was Edward after his father, and he was still in the line to become king. So he was held in suspicion. The, the family wasn't uh, treated very well. Uh, they were shown some kindness, however, uh, because during this time that, that they were there in, in England wondering what to do, uh, the King of Scotland, Malcolm III, came down, uh, met the family when he was there, uh, treated them kindly, was impressed with them, and then he, he went back to Scotland. Uh, but that little uh, encounter would, would come uh, and be important, as we'll see a few years later. Uh, so the family was there for about, oh, maybe um, eight or nine or ten years um, until the year 1066, which if anybody knows history was the year of the Battle of Hastings when William the Conqueror came and uh, the Norman king and he, he defeated the, um, the English king then. Oh, I can't remember his name. It was a Godwin, I think, was the English king. He was defeated in battle. And so this actually made uh, St. Margaret's brother Edward the king which he was for about two months. And then they fled into uh, Northumbria uh, to escape William the Conqueror, who of course didn't want any rivals. So they fled up eventually into Scotland. They were received kindly by um, uh, Malcolm III, uh, but, but um, St. Margaret's mother, Agatha, had just had enough of it. She'd been in England for about 11 years now. It had not been good for them. She decided, we're just gonna go back to Hungary, where, where I'm from, and just leave this all behind. Uh, but God had other plans. So they, they got on the boat to sail back across the English Channel, and it, the storm blew them north, and they landed uh, right on the shore where King Malcolm III had his palace. Now, King Malcolm, uh, he himself had been in exile for 17 years. His father, Duncan, uh, the Scottish king, was killed by an evil character named Macbeth. Right, this is the actual Macbeth that, that uh, um, Shakespeare wrote about, uh, or it's styled on the, the, a real Macbeth. He really, really was alive. He killed Malcolm's father, sent him into exile for 17 years. And so Malcolm III, uh, when, he, when he was close to, I think, his 30s, uh, or a little earlier, uh, regained the throne and, and was able to be king. So he knew what it was like to be in exile. He knew the hardships involved. He knew the difficulties. And so uh, by the time that this, this royal family landed, uh, St. Margaret of Scotland, uh, she'd been in exile and, and been kind of this treated poorly. She was nobility. She was royalty. <clears throat> Her father was a king. Now he wasn't a king. Um, it just, it had not been an easy life. Uh, but rather than let that uh, upset uh, her or, or uh, make her bitter or angry or, you know, woe is me, poor me, St. Margaret used it to, to just um, sharpen her virtues. She became more resilient, uh, more strong. Uh, she displayed a lot of fortitude, and that greatly impressed uh, the King of Scotland. So he um, eventually he asked for her hand in marriage, and they were married. And now St. Margaret, this princess in exile, this refugee, was now Queen of Scotland. So quite a, quite a difference for her. 
Uh, and she began with first things first, where, where every woman should begin, and that is it with her own domestic household. And while King Malcolm uh, had been toughened by his time in exile and even uh, displayed nobility of character, he was still rather uh, brutish in his manners, right? These are the Scots, and they'd been the barbarians, the Danes, and all that. So their, their, their manners weren't like uh, the, the refined manners in um, uh, the continental Europe. So uh, uh, St. Margaret was very patient, and he very much admired her graciousness, uh, her, her manner and demeanor. And uh, he was also illiterate. He couldn't read, so she would read stories to him from the Bible, which he, he, had, he liked and admired very much. So he had a, a, a tremendous respect for her and for her, her education and, again, her whole uh, gracious uh, bearing, uh, which, which gained um, her his complete trust. Uh, he made her his most trusted advisor. He would give her affairs of state. He placed her in charge of all kinds of things, uh, and hence we have the fulfillment of the reading today, right? Who can find a valiant woman, right? A husband who has found her has found a treasure, and his heart will rest in peace. And that is exactly what happened with uh, um, uh, St. Margaret and her husband Malcolm. Uh, so um, she put her household in order. Uh, she, by her graciousness and kindness, won over her husband, refined his manners and his piety, and then she set about to reforming all of Scotland. Uh, she was assisted by uh, the uh, abbot of Beck, which is in Normandy, France. The former abbot of Beck, whose name was Lan Frank, was called to Canterbury by William the Conqueror. So a little bit of uh, I guess good things came out of that. Um, Land Frank also was the one who um, educated uh, St. Anselm, right? Anselm of Canterbury, the, the great philosopher. So we see how the saints are all, they're all connected. Uh, but Land Frank came and she consulted with him. And uh, at this time, Scotland had been kind of, it had slipped away from uh, the church at Rome, not in doctrine, but in liturgical practices and discipline. And it was a little bit... Um, uh, in shambles, so to speak, we could say. So uh, Queen Margaret set about, she uh, encouraged ecclesiastical synods, she reformed the life of the clergy, she rebuilt monasteries and churches, built new ones, she invited in other orders from uh, Europe, the Benedictines, uh, to come in and teach. Uh, she promoted the arts, she promoted education and literacy among the people, uh, so very much advancing uh, civil society as well as uh, the church itself. Uh, she spent very much time in prayer, uh, you know, and, and nobody's able to do this, right? All, you think all these um, uh, matters that, that Queen, Queen Margaret was doing, um, um, all this, this public work, uh, this, this social work, uh, but it was, only, it was only effective because she had a good personal life of prayer. She spent a great deal of time in prayer. She would get up at midnight and read matins every single night. Um, she would retire. There was a nearby cave. She would go there often for greater solitude uh, and time in prayer. She would keep vigils at night so she could spend more time in prayer. And she was very was it sparing in her diet. So she fasted frequently. And both, both she and her husband would fast uh, not just for the period of Lent, but also for Advent, that penitential period as well. Uh, she was very, very generous to the common people, was always uh, inviting poor persons into the palace to, to, to eat with them. She would feed them with her own hands before taking her own food. Um, she cared for the orphans. Uh, she would wash the feet of the poor sometimes. And also she interceded uh, for the release of captives and those who'd been driven into exile. She assisted them as well. So very, very generous and caring. Um, one uh, lasting example of her um, philanthropy, we could say, and her, her um, well, what would you call it, like her, her social program, so to speak, uh, was there was a, uh, a shrine, St. Andrew's Shrine, uh, that was on one part of, there was, a, there was a channel, a body of water, and on one, part, one side was a, uh, a shrine to which pilgrims very often went for veneration, but it was a long and arduous journey. They had to go all, all the way around this large body of water, or they would take a, an expensive boat uh, across. So she instituted a ferry uh, subsidized by the king that made it very affordable for pilgrims to go back and forth across the channel. Um, the two towns, uh, two towns sprung up on either side of the route of the ferry called Queen's Ferry, and there are still towns to this day in Scotland, Queen's Ferry North and Queen's Ferry South, and the ferry service 
ran for 900 years that St. Margaret instituted. It only stopped in 1964 when they built a bridge across uh, the channel. So imagine that, a, a ferry system for 900 years thanks to Queen Margaret. So for over 20 years, Scotland enjoyed and greatly benefited from the charity and goodness of this, uh, this husband and wife team, we can say, They're just uh, totally devoted to each other. Uh, but it was uh, um, to end rather sadly, and, and quite quickly as a matter of fact, um, uh, perhaps in imitation of Christ, uh, um, for, um, you know, they lived a very good life, they um, had served others, but her husband, um, there was a, an, an uprising or an insurrection in one part of the country, and he left to go take care of it, and he was betrayed and murdered while he was on state business. At this same time, Margaret herself had been very sick from her fastings and her labors, and she actually asked him not to go, uh, but he felt it was his duty to go, and so he did, and he took their oldest son with them, and actually both he and her oldest son were, were killed uh, by these, these, uh, this uprising uh, through traitorous action, you know, much like our Lord. Uh, well, uh, Queen Margaret herself, uh, in her weakened state, when she heard of the death of her husband and her eldest son, uh, died of grief four days later. It was just too much for her. And so Scotland was de deprived of this very holy couple in just a matter of days. So a great blow to Scotland, uh, but her, um, uh, she and her husband had had six sons and two daughters. Uh, so they, they continued, and she had, she'd trained them very well. She'd brought them up in a very pious manner. And so they continued that legacy of their parents uh, for Scotland. Uh, so Queen Margaret um, uh, died a very holy death. In, uh, on 16 November 1093 was the date of her death. And um, she was canonized 150 years later. Uh, that was by Pope Innocent IV. And they moved her relics, uh, I think from where they had been interred, they moved her relics to a more prominent cathedral. Uh, but because of uh, the devotion that she had to her husband, they moved his relics, well, they weren't relics, they were just bones, but they moved him, his remains, with her as well so they could still be together. So a, a testament to their, their love for each other. Uh, sadly, however, uh, we have no more relics of St. Margaret uh, because in the Protestant uh, revolt in the 1500s, uh, Protestant um, uh, revolutionaries ransacked uh, churches and holy places and, and they scattered her relics. Uh, some of them were taken away to France and kept safe until the French Revolution, and then they destroyed those as well. So that's, that's the effect of revolutionaries and riots, right? They're always destructive. Uh, so uh, what an example by, by Queen Margaret. Um, uh, what, uh, I would say that her, the flowering of, of her um, reign, we could say, of taking care of people, of her great um, uh, uh, generosity to the poor, her, her leadership even, her, her capacity, her capability, those virtues were formed in those years of exile when she was being chased around and when she had to endure difficulty and hardship. That's when her character was formed and then her character was um, exercised or displayed when she became queen and had all of this power and influence, right? We, we don't want power and influence to come too easily. When that happens, it's too easy to fall into vanity, to fall into um, immaturity or imprudence, right? Those who've been tested in the fires of tribulation, those are the ones who can be trusted with, with the power of rule and governance, even as her husband was in exile for 17 years himself. They understood the plight of poor persons. They knew what it was like to be cold and hungry and so on. And certainly, they themselves were thinking of uh, and, and exampling Christ our Lord, who himself was a king in exile in Egypt when he was chased out of his own homeland and wandered around in, in Egypt and, on, and only came back later to inherit his kingdom. So I, I have to say, God is very, um, uh, you know, God sees everything in advance and he ordered the life of Christ our Lord uh, to, so that anybody in any state of life can always look to Christ as their personal example, right? If you are a poor laborer, if you're a carpenter or a plumber or a mechanic, you can look to St. Joseph, right? If you're a king, if you're living in a royal palace, you can look to St. Joseph, who was a king also. You can look to Christ our Lord, who was a king right? If you're unmarried and you're a virgin, you can look to Our Lady. If you're married and have kids, you can look to Our Lady, right? That's how God works things.
And so that is how St. Margaret lived her life, in, in imitation of Christ. And um, just a note to all you young princesses out there, right, uh, which all of you are. If you've been baptized, you are a princess in the kingdom of God. Your brother is Christ the king, uh, even as St. Margaret's brother was also a king. Uh, and you have a chance to be like Our Lady, but like St. Margaret. Gracious, kind, patience, courteous, right? That's how she won over her husband, the king, and that's how she transformed her kingdom, right? It's not by anger. It's not by indignance. It wasn't by, um, you know, all, all these things we see feminism promoting today. That's not how women are going to gain control, right? True control is controlling the heart, right? And controlling the, the, the lives of her household, of her husband and her children, devoted to her uh, by loving her loving kindness, right? That's always how it's, it's going to work. But all of us, right, all of us indeed can be like St. Margaret, building our character uh, in those difficult times, and uh, we look forward to the ultimate happy ending when all of us will be united with God in heaven, and we will all live happily ever after. Right? That's the goal of our lives. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.